Welcome to Medicine at the Museum with the University of Michigan Museum of Art. Today we are talking to artist Martin Vargas. Martin is a versatile artist who works in many mediums, who was incarcerated for 45 years for a crime he committed as a teenager. Martin found solace and inspiration making art and teaching art while in prison. His work has been exhibited at the University of Michigan Prison Creative Arts Project Annual Exhibition of Art by Michigan Prisoners. And he had his first solo exhibition at the University of Michigan in 2018. His work has been displayed around the world in Israel, Germany, Canada, Mexico, and China, and locally in universities, courtrooms, offices, churches, and hospitals. Today we're talking with Martin about his painting, Painting His Way Home. Welcome to Medicine at the Museum. We are so happy to talk with Michigan artist Martin Vargas today, who has very generously agreed to talk with us about his artwork. One of the things I'm really struck by with your work is you have this uncanny ability of photorealism to capture something that looks like it's a photograph. Like these images are just astonishing. But then you also have such a mastery of this really expressive and even sometimes abstract style. But you are well known for your signature style of these universal human figures, uh, which you call pudgies. So here's one in the shape of an artist. If we go back to your website, we can see many of these figures here. But do you mind telling us just a little bit about the background of these pudgies? Oh, there was a, a relief organization, a, a fundraising. They had a fundraising going on for um, people who were in desperate need of assistance in El Salvador and Honduras who suffered from a hurricane, Hurricane Mitch in the I think it was late 90s. They approached me and asked me if I could donate a painting or two to them so that they can raise funds. And I said, sure, I could do that. But I didn't know exactly what they wanted because they said just anything, anything will do. So I started just roughly creating images uh, for them. And I ended up with about 40 sketches, really rough, rudimentary figures uh, in, you know, brightly colored uh, backgrounds uh, to, to symbolize a rebirth for them. And I mm. asked these people to pick one or two and I would uh, finalize them. I would complete the paintings that they chose in my at that time, a uh, photorealistic way of creating these, uh, my paintings. And I showed them what I could do and they were really impressed. But yeah. in the end, they asked me if I could just donate the 40 sketches that I created instead of, you know, a couple of, you know, finished pieces. Mm -hmm. And so I said, yeah, I mean, that's, yeah, that, makes my job a lot easier because you already have them and sure you could do that. So I ended up giving them the, all the sketches and they sold them and they raised their money and, and everybody was happy. But after that, I received requests for commissions uh, for paintings using this stylized forms. And at that time they weren't stylized forms, they were just quick sketches. But I, I said, sure, you know, and I created pieces like this with these pudgies, uh, doing everything imaginable. When people ask me, can you, you know, can you make me one of these uh, ice skating? Sure, I could do that. Uh, boating, biking, uh, whatever, hiking, uh, having dinner with uh, friends and I started creating these um, commission pieces for people and somehow or another the, 
the more I created, the more they evolved and developed and the more people asked for them. So they came out of somebody's tragedy. Mm. But I guess in a way, to me, they represented, after, after I started paying them for people, they represent normal, everyday lifestyles, normal, yeah. everyday people. They have nothing that you can judge them by. There's no race, color, creed, religion, sexual preference, or yeah. anything that you can point to them and, and judge them by. So I think that's how, that's mm -hmm. why a lot of people like them because they're just people, period. They're, yeah. Well, they're not really people, but they're human-like. They, they represent humans to me, human beings. Yeah. They are beings. And I mean, I, I painted one painting me. So she's an artist and she's painting me. So they are just normal everyday people, which is something that I wanted to eventually become and mm -hmm. did. So I guess in a way they, they represent human form as human life as I would like to see human life to be. Mm. No judgments, you know, just normal, just beings doing yeah. everything and anything that we do in everyday life. Feeding babies, educating kids, uh, doctors uh, with stethoscopes on babies' chests and mothers holding hands or fathers holding, you know, their child in their arms and walking with them. Anything imaginable, I have painted them doing. Mm. But again, they came out of somebody else's tragedy, but right. it, but they became a gift to me in the end. Mm. And it was very cathartic. I mean, I, it, was, it was so, it was so healing to me. They, they just became, they helped me get through my times, my rough times. Wow. That's very powerful. And there are a few uh, of your paintings with uh, Pudgies that I wanted to ask you about. Um, there is one, this one in particular, Painting His Way Home. We spoke about this the other day, but if you don't mind sharing uh, a little bit of the inspiration behind this work again, that would be really um, helpful. The thing that strikes me about it is this figure in the center who you know you can see in the background, he's in this confined space, you can see the prison bars, but all of the work on the ceiling and the walls, this is like a retrospective of your artwork that you made in prison. Um, these are representations of real paintings that you've made. And then mm -hmm. what's happening with your with the green figure with the paintbrush and the opening in the wall. Can you tell us about this one? Well, that, well, that is my, my then, present, my past, and my future. Uh, obviously, my future is now here, and it yeah. is represented by that painting and the hole in the wall. Uh, that, but my present at the time was very, very confining, very limited, very small and tight, and the paintings obviously represent my past, paintings that I had created in the past. Uh, and that is my past actually, a part, that part of my past actually kept me healthy in mind and body. Yeah. Because it gave me a purpose. While I was in there, I needed a purpose. And painting was my purpose. And those, every single piece in there has a meaning and it has a story. As the big green guy in the middle does. I mean, that was me at the time in that confined space. Green, because to me, green is growth. It is a new beginning. It is spring. It is what I had intended to 
to to be to become free and and, and grow into the person that I am now out here instead of the person that I was back then in there. Yeah. You see the bars um, to the right of the face there, but they're not prominent. Even right. though that was my life for so many decades, it wasn't the most prominent and most obvious thing in my life. Painting was more prominent in my life oh. at the time because in spite of being in, locked up in that little tight confining space, I had a purpose and I actually did feel so much freedom mm. and release when I was involved with painting. Mm. And it just, and again, it gave me a purpose. It gave me a sense of being, it gave me a, a sense of belonging. And, and that is so important to me and not just me, but to everybody, I feel. Mm. Once you find your purpose, I think you can find so much peace inside. Mm. And of course, my painting on the wall, this was the last piece that I created inside. And I wanted, actually it just came out. I didn't intend for this piece to come out. I didn't think it up in my head beforehand. And yeah. said, oh, yeah, this is exactly what I'm going to do. I just started painting. Uh, I sketched, I created a little sketch. Oh, um, actually, that little sketch still exists behind the original painting. It still exists there. I taped it on there just to remind me of how that little, that piece developed. And none of that. I mean, it does, it kind of resembles that, but it doesn't really look like that. But I just wanted to, uh, to make, to paint something powerful. My last piece in there, it just developed on its, on its own, but I started with the big green guy and I wanted him to be painting like a mural, but then mm -hmm. things just evolved and, and, and this just came out and, and the mural became my, my future, which you know, which is now my present. It strikes me, you know, looking at it with you today, that there's almost a birth, you know, you've talked about rebirth in the green, but there's mm -hmm. something about like the tight space and then the creation of this opening that you're, you know, you're literally looking out onto your, your new life here and creating, mm -hmm. creating the doorway to that through your artwork, which is really powerful. Yes. Yeah. And yeah. if you, and as I said, you know, prison was not my most prominent uh, the feature in there. And as you notice that that hole in the wall, that painting, that mural on the wall is actually twice as big as yeah. the bars in the background. Because nice. to me, yeah. that was, you know, my where I was going meant, you know, so much more than where I was at the time. And you did so much, you know, you, I know that you were teaching art, you were tutoring art, you were making, you had your own art practice every day that you were doing, and you even exhibited your art um, while you were still inside, which, uh, which is incredible. I know we at the University of Michigan uh, have been so happy to, you know, be able to enjoy your, your art for so many years. You participated with the Prison Creative Arts Project's annual uh, exhibit of art that's made by Michigan prisoners. And then once once getting out, you know, you've continued to exhibit your work and it's been displayed all over the country and all over the world. One of your paintings uh, that we talked about previously, this one, I love this painting. So Making Medicine, um, to me, this is also, it has some similarities to the image that we just looked at and that it's, you know, it's somewhat of a confined space. Um, not quite as tight, but you can see this opening in the background and in that opening, you can see that green life happening. But then there's this figure in the center. Can you tell us what this figure is doing and what they represent? Well, the figure, and, it, and it's funny, no, it's not funny. It's, 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 it's cool that you mentioned that it's not a tight space, but it's, it's isolated. It's right. an isolated space, similar to prisons, 
but even though it's isolated, there's still freedom. There's still freedom in what that pudgy is doing. She is creating medicine. She is performing a ritual, a ceremony um, to the spirits, to the elements of the earth, the wind, fire, water, air. She is creating a healing ceremony. And that is usually done by not just Native American people, but a lot uh, of it comes from Native American uh, spirituality. It's not a religion, it's more of a, a way of life. Uh, and I tended to um, identify with that a lot more than any other ways of life. Uh, and, and she is isolated intentionally she has confined herself to that environment because she wants to help she wants to heal she wants to connect like yogis of old older times used to do like uh, uh priests used to isolate themselves uh in shaolin temples and yeah. different places like that to be more in tune and more in touch with the spiritual side of nature. And that's what this Pudgy is doing, connecting with the elements, connecting with the spirituality of the universe. And, and she is creating medicine. She's making medicine for the world, not just for herself. It, it's, not, it's never selfish. When you make medicine like that, it's never for you personally, it's for others. And I, I see also that there is art on the walls inside the cave. <laughs> yeah, there so many people have identified uh, in so many places, cave dwellings that have art inside them. I mean, art goes back as far back as, as, as life goes back. Yeah. People, there have been artists that have painted on walls, they have painted up themselves, you know, whether it's handprints, whether it's symbols that they believe in to be powerful, whether it's representations of the animals that exist in their environment. They have, there have been artists since the beginning of time. And I just wanted to show that art is not something new. It's, it's, it's universal, first of all. Yeah. And it, it is, it's been around forever and it's healed people yes. because it gives them a sense of purpose. It gives them something to do. And it also teaches people. So it's not just healing, but it's also instructional. It's instructive. It's very, very educational. And we see that so many times people nowadays are making big discoveries, you know, oh, we found pieces of art in shipwrecks. Right. We found pieces of art in caves, you know, and what do these pieces of art tell us about the people that created them? You know, I mean, the endless stories, the endless possibilities that have been created by the creation of art. So it's art is so very powerful. It's such a bridge of connection to that you can you know, whether we're looking at art that's from thousands of years ago or, you know, from two minutes ago, that it's this tangible sensory experience mm. that, you know, invites us into the world of another person. And and even if we think that our experiences are so radically different, you know, there's something there that we're able to connect with, which is really, really intense. And in another one of your works, this one, let's see if we can get... I hate to go past any of these. I want to talk about all of them. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have to get together someday later. Yeah. <laughs> it would be great. Uh, so this image has a very special story. And um, I'll ask you to talk about it a little bit. And then I have a specific question about one part of it. Um, but I would love to hear the background of this piece. That piece was created when I was uh, 
very, very, I guess, feeling, feeling down, feeling negative, feeling angry, feeling depressed about where I was and believing that I would never make it out here and I would never go home. And I just started putting, it's, it's black and white, it's charcoal, and I just wanted to make it stark and dramatic and, and as real as I could imagine my journey to be at that time. It was confusing, it was chaotic, it was depressing as hell because it's yeah. seemingly no way out. And, you know, you go through one place and there's platforms and some of the platforms are uh, meant to show how there have been people I have seen a couple, maybe three people actually jump off very high galleries, 50 feet. Oh, wow. Up. And some, a couple of them did not die, but they wanted to kill themselves in the, the desperation that they felt throughout that journey that they were taking, similar to my journey, similar to many prisoners journey. Yeah. So that's why the empty platforms are there uh, to show that, you know, you could just jump off and, and go into the depths of that environment and try to kill yourself if you want. Uh, or you can lock yourself up as far down in the dungeons of that environment mm. if you continue to be bad and people think that you're a negative person and a mean person and an incorrigible person. They'll keep isolating you further and further and further into the prison system. Um, so in order to release my negative energy, I got into this piece and just started, you know, one thing led to another. There was no form, no reason, no actual uh, end in sight to what I started. I was part way through it. And then I was asked if I, I was selected by the University of Michigan to, to see if I could come up with a painting or a piece that I could donate to them so that they could in turn donate it to United States Supreme Court Justice Sonia Sotomayor right. for her contribution at uh, an event that was held for Martin Luther King rally. Mm. So I said, yeah, I can do something like that, you know. And I, I was also fortunate that I had read her book, but I read it again. And for some reason or another, this piece that I was working on struck me as being the perfect piece to complete with a few additions here and there to sort of, you know, illustrate some of the tra traumatic uh, events that happened in her life. And so, I completed it and I just, you know, added things and, and, and when it was given to her, I mean, it, the, the, the piece was started with no purpose in mind, but it became so very, I mean, the purpose in the end was like, wow. I mean, it was meant to be given to her. That's yeah. incredible. That's incredible. And I couldn't believe it. And, you know, eventually when she got it, she made the comment to the to D Dean Dworkin, who presented it to her, uh, that you know that she was so impressed by it, and how could the artist that created it know that that was actually her life? Wow. How could I paint her life like that? And well, that wasn't my my initial. Uh, reason for starting that, but it just shows how trauma, how confusion, how chaos exists in just about everyone's life. Right. And so many people have told me that they identify with this piece yeah. through the tragedies and traumas that they have gone through. It's very powerful. And I know when we've spoken before, you've pointed out there are a few little um, kind of hidden symbols mm -hmm. throughout this image. Um, one of them that really speaks to me very powerfully uh, is 
at the upper left, there's sort of a rail, what looks like maybe a courtroom rail, but below that, still in the in the sort of spiral staircase area, and I might be able to even point to it, here we go, is this, which you've pointed out as being a mirror. And I wonder if you could speak a little bit about that and what that what that mirror represents to you. That mirror was an intentional symbol to me that represented my, my life at that particular time, but it also represents everybody's, uh, it represents something inside everybody because that mirror represents reflection, just right. like all mirrors, all mirrors reflect. But we, everybody, I don't care who you are, we have to go through that self inspection, introspection, self realization, self identity. We have to look at ourselves really, really well and see what the reflection of us is telling us in, as individuals. Who are, who am I? What am I? What am I supposed to be here for? What is my purpose? Why am I suffering so much? We have to go through that introspection. And without it, without going through that self introspection, we can identify what is really so traumatic in our lives, so destructive to our own beings. And if we can't identify it, then we can't fix it. Right. If we, if we can name what it is that, that is destroying us individually, if it's drugs, if it's um, a bad relationship, if it's, uh, oh, I don't know, uh, putting things off, you know, just never finishing something, if it's, you know, worrying to death about everything, if it's fear, if it's, you know, being bullied, whatever it is that's really bothering us and we can't go ahead with our lives, if we think, you know, we're so overweight and we can't do anything about it, and, we just pity ourselves you know if we can't name that problem we can never fix it right so that mirror gives we have to every single one of us has to go through that introspection point if we don't do it and we are not honest with ourselves we'll never get over our problems mm -hmm. and so many people inside prison and again not just physical prisons with bars and steel and concertina wire but the prisons that we sometimes put ourselves in, shame is a prison, you know, mm -hmm. feeling lonely all the time is a prison, feeling rejected and abused by everybody is a prison that we sometimes put ourselves in. But if yeah. we can't name that, then how can we get out of it? Wow. And it's interesting to me, the placement of that image, you know, that it is so close to you know, I also kind of see that uh, railing behind it. It looks like there's almost an open road. And, uh, you know, I can imagine that as a road that can either bring you into this maze where you feel trapped or it can be the path out at the same time. But that there is this moment of self-reflection there. And there are so many other kind of vignettes throughout. And I can see uh, in the upper right here, there's actually, you know, a human figure who's who's moving through this space. Um, that is, that one was me, of course, at the time working my way, having worked my way up to that point, wow. having gone through the depths that you see beneath that space, uh, through all those you know, caverns and doorways and steps and entrances that lead to nowhere. And I, I had at that particular time reached that level that I can look over, once I took three or four more steps, I could look over that uh, abyss, I guess, and see that in fact, there is a possibility, there is, life on the other side of all that chaos and confusion. Mm. It's just, 
you have to take that journey. You have to walk it. You have to live it. You have to go through it before you can see that there is an end in sight. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You've talked about, um, you've used the word normal a few times about mm -hmm. life on the outside. And um, I asked you, the first time we spoke, I asked you, you know, what did you want our audience to know about you as a person and as an artist? And I wonder um, how you would answer that today. Well, what I want people to know about me as an artist is that, you know, and about being normal is that, you know, normal is not a an end all. It's not a definitive word. It doesn't mean, oh wow, now I'm normal. Now I'm I'm safe. I'm home safe now. Normal is is just so many different things to so many different people. I see normal in just about everyone I meet out here. People wave to me when I'm walking down the street. I wave back to them. And it makes me feel so good that they do that because inside prison, people just don't wave at you and say hello. Very seldom do people look you in the eye unless they're very close friends and, and they have something to say to you because sometimes it's an offensive thing to just stare at somebody or look at somebody. People take it the wrong way. Uh, and out here, just talking to somebody in, in, in the store or going shopping for groceries and having somebody say hello or, or how are you or good morning or can you tell me where to find the milk or where do you find the coffee or whatever. You know, it's such a normal thing to do. But yeah. it's the normal, the normal thing to me about being an artist out here is that, well, first of all, that's a label that I give myself. Mm -hmm. That's who I identify myself as. When people ask me, what do you do? I tell them I'm an artist and this is what I do. And conversations start and sometimes commissions develop as a result. Mm -hmm. But it is a label that I give myself. It's not a label that the Department of Corrections gave me. It's not a label that other prisoners have given me or guards give me or whoever. It is my label. It is my choice to call myself an artist. Uh, and I embrace it with a purpose and, 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 a, and a love because that is who I am. That is my identity. I didn't, I couldn't do that before. But I mean, people associate titles with normalcy. Professors, assistant professors have those identities as well. That's how they identify themselves with it. This is who I am. Right. And that that is good. That is great because it shows you who you are. You have identified yourself. You have looked in that mirror and you have found what it is that you are, the purpose in life. And just being normal, it's just if I could find a license plate that says normal, I would buy that and put it on my car. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Um, there's another piece I'd like to ask you about if you have another minute. This image, which I think is cut off a little bit, unfortunately, uh, on my screen, but um, this also really caught my attention when I was looking through your work on your website. Uh, partially because I spend so much time in museums. I work in museums uh, with my oh. research and at the University of Michigan Museum of Art. And, and so this was just a very familiar type of feeling to me when I looked at it. Um, mm -hmm. And so I, I can also recognize now talking with you um, that this is an image that's filled with, with punchies, with your, with your uh, signature figures here. But if you don't mind sharing a little bit about this image and you know what it what it represented to you when you created it and maybe what it might mean to you now that you are on the outside and displaying your work and um, being on kind of a different different end of display of your own work. Hmm. Um, you know, you you've 
you've been pointing out pieces that actually have been uh, created because of my feelings of uh, my negative feelings. Oh. Uh, no, 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 that's fine. That's fine. But you picked so many that are and were actually uh, they, they, were, they were paintings that created that were created as a result of my feeling down and low mm -hmm. and useless and un, you know, I mean, who the hell am I? You know, I'm nobody. I don't have a purpose. Mm -hmm. I don't have a reason. I don't have a, I didn't have a sense of purpose. And at this time I was going through that type of uh, feeling like, oh, I'm not, you know, I'm never going to get out of here and, and mm -hmm. I'll never see my work in galleries or museums or exhibits and, uh, and so I decided to create my own exhibit, my own gallery, my own museum. And I put my pieces that I had created in the past, the two seemingly three-dimensional figures on the floor, the ice skater doing the triple-triple, and the young woman with an embryo on her shoulders that I call yeah. the weight of the world um, because of the young women in their early teens or preteens being giving birth to babies and they're still babies. All those pieces, mm -hmm. the the four directions, the the one on the far upper left hand corner, and the ones way in the back, two in the back, uh, there were paintings that I had completed before and sold, but I wanted to put them in a setting like this where people could walk around and view them as the works of art that they are. Yeah. But I put them in a collection and I stuck them in this building and I put people walking around in them, looking at them. And uh, <laughs> actually, uh, the, I mean, the, it was like, okay, I'm never going home and I'm never going to see my works in ex on exhibit in real life. So, I'll create my own museum. I will do my own exhibit. And this painting came out as a result of that. It was a, you know, a dark moment in my life and inside. And I wanted to, to create something, a dream, a dream of mine. And this was actually a dream. And in fact, I am in that painting as well. In the lower right hand corner, you see a pudgy, you know, with a little child, a young child, and that yeah. pudgy has mustache. And that, ah! mustache <laughs> <laughs> and that mustache is a symbol of me. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I put myself in the gallery, in the museum, and, and walking around in there, showing that, you know, I was out in, in, the, in this world as well. Yeah. Through my art. But, um, now that I'm out of here, uh, and PCAP has, I've been working with PCAP since almost the first month that I have been out, uh, and they have taken me into their family, uh, and I am, this year I was, you know, I guess nominated or voted or elected or asked to be uh, a curator ah. and to be a part of this group that has been a part of my life for now 25 26 years was an honor is an honor mm -hmm. but what it also does is if you look at this painting you see the the paintings that are hanging on the wall i never knew how to hang paintings on walls i knew how to paint them but I didn't know how to curate them. I didn't know how to hang them. I didn't know how to buy things. I mean, I just painted, period. Yeah. And somebody else was doing all the hard work of displaying them <laughs> or putting them up somewhere. And I didn't know how hard that was until I came out here and I participated in activities that actually enabled me to, to hang a painting to try to hold it in place while somebody else held the wire or try to put the hooks in place or get the wires to do, you know, get the wire to put behind the painting so that it can hang yeah. and try to figure out, well, is this going on the left? Is it going on the right of this piece? Where should it go? I never knew all that, but it is very, very hard work to set up an exhibit. 
to me, I just painted this and said, well, I'm going to paint this piece here and I'm going to paint this other piece here and I'm going to put this here. But it's hard work trying to put an exhibit together, trying to pick what pieces are going where and what looks good next to this. You know, it's not that easy. So I have uh, worked with PCAP uh, in, uh, and, and they've taught me a lot actually. And I've, I've learned by experience as well. My first exhibit that I put up was a disaster. Pieces were falling off because I didn't have the proper uh, 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 material to hold them up. Uh, the nails were coming apart or off the wall or whatever. I mean, but I learned from that. So now I can set up an exhibit. I know what, what to do. Uh, I know what it takes. I know where to go buy stuff that I need beforehand and not at the last minute. Uh, <laughs> it's just been a continuation of, of a journey or a life of art, of an artist that started inside, but it's still ongoing out here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. That's amazing. <laughs> we are so um, honored and thrilled and delighted that you are sharing your work uh, you know, through the University of Michigan Museum of Art website, this, uh, but it has been, it has really been an incredible experience to get to, to see your paintings and your drawings and, and to talk with you and hear your stories and your perspective. Um, and I just, I appreciate so much your generosity in, in sharing your time with us. Well, it's the least I can do. I mean, really, uh, you know, that I can't not speak about this if I'm asked. Mm -hmm. It's part of my life now, mm -hmm. and I'm glad. It's an incredible, incredible gift of you to do that. And I'm going to take it back uh, one image. You know, again, this this picture of you creating, mm -hmm. you know, this doorway to your new life. I mean, this is going to stay with me for a long time. Um, and I know we've spoken before also about, you know, what people who are still inside are experiencing right now in this sort of bizarre historical moment that we're all getting through, you know, with coronavirus specifically, that that kind of isolation and fear that people have on a daily basis is just really amplified um, by what's happening. And I know in Michigan, we've had a lot of cases of prisoners who have uh, tested positive, have been infected. Uh, but nationally, you know, we've had, I mean, really an epidemic of corona in prisons and we've had hundreds of deaths. Um, and, you know, we think of them as, you know, we, you know, look at your art also and think about, you know, navigating that type of fear. And I wonder if you can share anything from your own experience of navigating, you know, the healthcare system inside what you think prisoners might be going through right now in this moment that we're all experiencing. You know, the, the, the healthcare system inside is, it really is, it has done so much good through this COVID period. I mean, in Michigan, deaths are not as numerous as I thought they were going to be wow. because of the way I saw uh, and lived being in prison. Yeah. Everything is in the way. Everything is, there's so many people. It's impossible, literally impossible to stay six feet away from everybody all the time that you're there. It's not, it, you just can't do it. People are living on bunk beds on top of each other, across from each other, and six man cubes, eight man cubes, in some cases, 16 man cubes and 10 man cubes. That means that there's 10 people in like, for example, a room of maybe 10 feet long by, you know, eight feet wide, uh, 12 feet wide. It's very, very, very crowded. But in spite of the, you know, confining environment, Michigan has been very, very good about not having more deaths inside prison than I thought were going to be in there. Mm -hmm. So 
as I used to see the healthcare system, I used to complain about it all the time because I didn't treat my my concerns then. But you know, the healthcare system is really handcuffed on the one hand because they can't just you know yeah. admit that a person has a certain medical uh, issue because once they do that, then they have to treat it. Yeah. And and in order to treat it, they have to have the funds. Well, there just aren't that many funds to go around to treat every specific medical condition inside prisons. But the most, and, and again, the most rampant thing running inside Michigan prisons right now, and probably most prisons, besides the coronavirus, is fear. Yeah. Fear is just, it's probably a bigger issue right now than the virus is. Because again, mm -hmm. in Michigan, they are doing very, very good about treating people, isolating people, uh, quarantining people, and then putting people who don't have the virus anymore in, again, isolated areas. Yeah. But again, that isolation, I mean, there's no more visits. You can't really speak to, you can't speak to loved ones or people that used to come visit you all the time the way you used to because it's not safe. Yeah. It's good that Michigan is trying to maintain a safe environment, but in creating that safe environment, you're also creating isolation. And that is just so ugly because if you can't talk to people, then you talk to yourself and you come up with all kinds of scenarios that, you know, and you, and it's just scary. It's just, you know, everything is fear and isolation is magnified to the maximum. Who knows what happens when, you know, fear is, is magnified like this, you know, eventually people break, you know, right. they, you know, pressure is, you know, mental pressures, uh, emotional pressures, psychological pressures, you know, they say pressure can bust a pipe, mm. you know, and pressure can also bust somebody's will to continue wow. in a sane environment. And so communication yeah. and connection with people inside is one of the most important things that can be going on right now through this COVID mm -hmm. period. Reaching out. Yes, reaching out and connecting and connecting. That's really helpful. That's really helpful to know. Is there anything that I have not asked about that you think is important or would like to share? I'd like to just say that, you know, I don't know if, if people inside prison will be seeing this or if people's loved ones out here will be seeing this or not, but it's just so important at this time, this horrible times that we're going through, it's just so important to really, really connect, to really reach yeah. out, to send a letter, to send a postcard. It doesn't matter what the letter says, just to give somebody that hope that somebody out here is still listening. Somebody out here is still here for them. Uh, this is, the, 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 the best time ever to continue to let them know that, that we are out here, mm -hmm. that we do care, that we know that they're in there. And we may not be able to see them. We may not be able to connect with them in physical ways, and, but they can't give up. Nobody can give up right now. This is a time when you show how strong you are, how really strong you are. This is just a challenge. Just like any other challenge, if somebody challenges you to a fight, for example, out in the yard, I mean, you're not going to back down. Of course, you're going to accept the challenge and you might lose a fight. But so what? You fought. You fought it out. The same thing right now. This COVID situation is a big challenge. We have to accept it. We have to say, yeah, I can face this. I can I can take on this challenge and I'm going to be better for it in the, in, in the long run. Mm -hmm. I'll live through it. I'll have gone through it, you know, create something, write something, write a story about it, mm -hmm. write what you see, write what you feel, write what makes you angry, what makes you scared. And don't be ashamed of writing it out. I mean, 
Yeah. If you have a loved one inside prison, write what's scaring you right now about the people inside prison. Write what's good in your life. Write what, what you hate. Write who you hate. It doesn't matter. I mean, it's just, you know, let it all out. Let, you know, this is a very, very good time to heal yeah. yourself. And this is what we all need is a, a lot of cleansing, a lot of healing. Mm -hmm. Well, your work is such a powerful vision of that, you know, even in the painting that's on the screen right now, you know, the healing that you have done in your own life, through your art, through your work, and then that you're continuing to do now that you're on the outside is incredibly powerful. And it's very healing to be able to, um, to look at it and understand it and talk with you. And I just want to thank you for taking the time to talk with us.